We've worked in and lived next to liquefied natural gas storage facilities in Providence, Rhode Island, Exeter, Rhode Island, Cumberland, Rhode Island, and four of them asked for many, many years. And we often forget that these facilities are here because of the outstanding safety records of the operation of these plants, the renovation work, and the maintenance of these facilities. Once again, I'm only a pipe fitter whose job now is to provide work opportunity for members of Local 51. But we're also residents and neighbors of these facilities. And in order to provide any type of support for this project or any other project, we must believe in the viability and the need for such a job. And we must also believe in the ability to construct and operate it in a safe manner. It is true that there, have been, there is an inherent risk with liquefied natural gas. However, it's proven throughout its history to be a safe and economical product for the supplementation of our natural gas distribution system, which supplies our needs for the power generation industry and for our everyday comfort. There have been problems in the past, and there will most likely be problems in the future. But our job is to limit the occurrence and the liability of those problems through the safe installation and construction of these and other facilities. And should this facility be built, that's exactly what we intend to provide through our membership. I've also included some uh, specification sheets for the INVAR 93 and also for the 317L, which will be used on the uh, pipe in a pipe system. And also, at the very end, I've included some uh, welding specifications that were, uh, that were qualified previously for the INVAR 93. And also, our organization, the United Association, we, uh, we uh, use the welding procedures from 3313. Uh, they're called UA certifications. They are also included in there for the the type of welling that will be completed out there. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Before I open the uh, up for questioning, I first want to identify uh, actually one gentleman who was here at the outset, uh, one of our colleagues from over in the house, and I want to make sure I noted that he was here, uh, Representative Peter Martin from uh, Newport. Also, having joined us uh, while you were testifying is uh, Senator William Malaska, who represents the uh, great city of Warwick, and uh, to my immediate left is uh, Senator Joshua Miller, who is from the city of Cranston. And um, again, I thank you for your testimony and the uh, accompanying documents, because the, uh, the questions regarding this pipes uh, and the pipe within the pipe have emerged before. I will mention that actually one of my close friends from grammar school, St. Anthony, is uh, every career mm -hmm. from Portsmouth. Pipe fitter, I'm, I'm fairly certain is in your organization. He's uh, one of our more higher qualified welders, actually. Uh, you don't have to say that. I know him. <laughs> but he is. <laughs> um, any members of the commission have any questions? Yes. Uh, let me set it to Max. Yes, uh, you had mentioned in the beginning about the um, 2.5 million hours, 36 mm -hmm. months, and what was the amount of workers you estimated? By doing the math, we're looking at about 400 workers. Now I'm assuming that's pipe fitters, there'll be other building trades involved. Okay. And, and, and I guess uh, for me, as I listen to the various <coughs> testimonies, and uh, you, you, you said something about um, kind of alleviating the fears and looking at the employment aspect is as we hear uh, testimony from various aspects of the community, there's, uh, there's fear of the people that live along the route Mm -hmm. We heard fears from the environmental people. I guess there's fears uh, uh, from different people in authority, whether it's state or federal, and whose turf. So I guess there's fears about whose turf is, uh, is being invaded or whose turf is being respected. So we heard a lot of different testimony. So I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is I know there's fear, and certainly in this economy, uh, everybody's swayed by the employment aspect, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to, for me as, as a commission member, that's what I'm trying to, to, uh, uh, to get the sense of, is uh, 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 there's fear, and then what's the reality associated with those fears, and then there's the reality of the uh, employment aspect, and then trying to bring that all home to come up with a, a good decision. But I, I do thank you for your, uh, for your testimony as far as the employment. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the fear is something that uh, is coming from a lot of different directions that, they, that the commission members that we have to deal with. M many times when we discuss this, because, you know, this Weaver's Cove project, as long as we've been involved with it since their, their beginning, it, for many of our members, it's not a slam dunk. 
I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of our members that have apprehension about it. And what we try to, try to equate it to is the early 70s, late 60s, when the nuclear phase came through. There was a lot of apprehension about nuclear power, the China syndrome, uh, you know, the meltdown, core meltdown. That's why we do have a lot of unemployment. And one of the reasons we have a lot of unemployment is because a lot of these type of projects are mostly put aside because of the fears of what could happen. And that's why we try to say, we're, we're going, if we're going to build this thing, we're going to give the, the best work possible to build it. Because we do live there, and, and that's our name that's on it. And many times, it's our people that are involved in it. And uh, there's risk to it. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's gas. There's risk to it. But uh, I think we have to take a look at the economic benefits to that risk and uh, try, to, try, to, try to weigh the options and make the best decision that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I appreciate your candor and your frankness. Uh, now I am going to, uh, I believe, uh, Senator De Palma is the gentleman who has uh, brought up a lot of uh, interest and, and um, awareness of the issue with regard to the piping. So mm -hmm. I'd like to ask uh, Senator De Palma if you have any questions to go yeah. forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Tim, for mm -hmm. uh, providing the written testimony as well as the, the facts and data behind the pipe, the corrosion mm -hmm. resistance, the type mm -hmm. of material. Uh, Etc. Some of the operating conditions. So I have a few questions, if you don't mind, uh, we'll sure. one at a time. With regards to this pipe and a pipe, are you aware of this type of pipe and a pipe being used underwater? I know that I think this type of material and pipe has been used above ground. Yep. So my, one of my concerns uh, is the impact of obviously salt water. Right. The environment with regards to uh, looking at. So let me say one other piece and I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to answer the question. So we're talking about resistance to corrosion. However, service tests are recommended to account for the effects of specific operating conditions they may affect mm -hmm. corrosion behavior. This goes back to I, one of the questions I had asked uh, back in, I think it was June or July of 2008 at Mount Hope High School. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain Perry was here at the Coast Guard, folks in Weaver's Cove, a whole host, sent a host of folks were there. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I asked, I said, where have we used this pipe? And whether it's a mile long or a half mile long, this right. one's expected to be 4.25 miles long, right. so four and a quarter miles long. Where has this pipe been used underwater before for mm. pumping LNG? Right. Not gas, we're not gasifying it. Right. It's pumping LNG at a pretty low temperature. And they said, well, we've done simulations. Mm -hmm. uh, as an engineer, simulations are great. They right. get us close. I'm sure you know from uh, looking at a new type of uh, welding material, mm -hmm. Somebody comes, a new company, new manufacturer comes out and says, uh, like it says in here, molybdenum might be an additive, mm -hmm. great for this environment, given the, uh, the tensile strength or whatever, it's a good thing to use. Well, you're going to try it and say, right. hmm. So we're, can you talk to that where have you seen or aware of this pipe being used underwater? That, this type of design, a pipe within a pipe, I'll be honest with you, I've never, I've never seen it used in this application. The 317L, I've seen it used before uh, in an app, well, most similarly over at uh, Amgen, for example. We've got 317L systems over there on the steam and the condensate returns. Uh, it provides a high corrosion resistance factor, and with the chemical additives that we put into the steam and the heat exchanges, it helps to, uh, to help that. Uh, we have used, I have, I have seen uh, 317, 317NL, I believe it is, I believe it's NL. Uh, I've seen that in underground. Uh, gas transmission lines that go, well, for example, Long Island Sound, Spectra Energy used it for a while. Uh, they had a laydown area over in um, Quonset. Some of our members did fabrication for that. That was used for, for regular gas transmission lines. Uh, this pipe in a pipe system, I'm going to be honest with you, it's new to us. And that's why we're trying to do as much digging as possible. And I requested as much information as possible on the welding specifications for it so that we could match it up to what we have. And then come to find out that this INVA is used a great deal in the NASA industry. And uh, that's where our UA certifications were developed. We're down on that, using that INVA with the uh, M93 and also M63. So with regards to the specs, are we looking at 317LMN or 317L? 317L is, is what they're promoting for the jacketed pipe system. 